Well, we started a few weeks ago this series called Living in the Spirit. And our goal is for you to learn how not to live by the power of the flesh, the power of your own ability, but rather to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only way you can possibly live the kind of life that God has called you to live. So today, we're gonna talk about how to have power for living. How you can have that kind of power that is going to propel you in your Christian life. Let me, I've got a real burden for this. Uh, the fact is there are many people and many churches and many Christians that when it comes to living the Christian life, they live under a giant cloud of guilt. That, that's how they live. It seems like that the harder they try, the worse it gets. And it becomes very, very frustrating. In fact, it's an impossible, impossible way to live. And yet so many Christians live this way. So many uh, churches live this way and they have a problem and they don't acknowledge it. Have you ever had a problem? You ever just had a big problem that you just couldn't hardly, you couldn't hardly tackle, you couldn't hardly do anything with? Yeah, a lot of you ladies are like, yeah, I'm married to him. I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Well, I'm not talking about your husband, but I'm talking about a problem that uh, seems to just burden you and overwhelm you and you can't shake it and you can't fix it and it becomes more and more frustrating. I, I've had many things like that in my life, not just in my Christian life, but in my personal life. Um, when I was 16 years old, I bought my very first car. I'd worked really hard, saved my money, paid cash for my very first car at 16 years old. And it wasn't the greatest car in the world, but it was a Mustang II, which was not quite as good as a Mustang, but it was a Mustang II. And uh, so, you know, I got it and I was, I was driving it and I was, I was enjoying life. I was 16 years old, you know, I got my driver's license and I'm driving up to school with all the pretty ladies and like, what's up, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of a babe magnet, you know, I thought. So uh, anyway, I... Um, I, I was driving this car and I was feeling good for about a couple weeks. And then after a couple weeks, I had something happen. The engine started smoking. Now, you know, not smoking in a good way, smoking in a bad way, all right? So I, I went to crank this car and all of a sudden this, this smoke, this uh, almost like fire starts coming out from under the hood of this car. And I, and I got out and I'm like, you know, what in the world is going on? I'm trying to fix it. I did, I'm not a mechanic. I didn't know what to do. And you know what I did? I did what a lot of us do when we have a problem that we don't know what to do with it. First of all, I tried to ignore it. You ever just try to ignore a problem, pretend it go away? Well, if I just ignore it, it won't be there anymore. Kind of like a little child that kind of, you know, plays peekaboo, you know, and they, they, you can't, they think that you can't see them as long as they can't see you. And, and, and that's what I tried to do. First of all, I just tried to ignore it and I tried to drive it anyway, but it didn't work. Second thing I tried to do is I tried to wish the problem away. You ever just whine and complain and cry and wish that life was different than it was? That's easy to do, isn't it? I mean, we get so caught up and uh, just whining and wishing that things were different and wishful thinking and not really doing anything about it. I was trying to do that with that car and that obviously didn't work. I just stared at it a little bit, you know. And then the third thing I really, really should not have done, I tried to fix it with a hammer. <laughs> you, you ever try something that doesn't work? You ever try to fix something really important and it doesn't work, but you do it anyway? That's what I did. I grabbed a hammer and I'm like tapping on the engine and hitting stuff, hitting things. I didn't even know what they were. I didn't know if it was supposed to be hit or not, but I did know that I was just like, you know, hammering away at my problem and my problem wasn't getting better. It didn't get any better. It didn't get it fixed. And so my dad, thankfully, he, he found out what was wrong with the car and he helped me fix my problem. He got rid of the Mustang and he got me a 1973 Pinto station wagon with wood grain panel going down both sides. Now here's my question. Who in their right mind 
was thinking, you know what this car needs? Some wood on the side of the car. Uh, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. But there I had it, a 1973 Pinto station wagon with wood grain paneling down the sides. And in case you're wondering, that was not a babe magnet, all right? That was not, that didn't do me any favors with the ladies, all right? I'm just telling you, uh, it did not. Well, in the uh, passage that we're gonna read today, we're going to address what so many of us feel, what so many of us experience, the problem that so many of us have, and we don't know how to deal with it. It's Paul's letter to the Galatian church. And he identified a problem in this church. And these were real people, just like you and me. And uh, they were, it was a real church and they had a real problem. And, and, and here's what Paul wrote. He said, you have a problem and the problem is you. Now that's not very nice, is it? I mean, you know, whenever you start thinking about problems and things that need to be fixed, and oftentimes we always want to point to somebody else. Well, there's the problem. Well, what they did or what she didn't do, there's the problem. Over there's the, but no, Paul said, no, stop trying to pass the blame. Stop pretending that it's somebody else's problem. The problem, you've got a problem and the problem is you. Now, their problem was that they were trying to live the Christian life in a way that God never intended for them to live. They were trying to deal with their sin in their own power. They were trying to have a relationship with God in their own strength. And like I said before, I think churches are filled with people that are just like this. They, they, they want to serve God. They want to love Jesus. In their heart, they do love Jesus. But there is a giant cloud over their life. It seems like everything that they try fails. And it seems like the harder they try to keep a list of rules and the more good things they try to do, the more they fail at it and, and the more miserable they become. And the, the more they try to overcome their sin, the more sin conscious they become and they just continue to trip and to fall. You ever notice that? I noticed that growing up as a young man. I became very sin conscious. I knew that God was calling me in the ministry. I knew God was calling me to serve him. And so I, I knew that what I needed to do was to deal with sin in my life. I was just a teenage boy and I had sin in my life just like anybody else. But the more I became conscious of my sin, the more I white knuckled it. You know what I mean when I say I white knuckled it? Uh, I grew up in a church where they would give the invitation where you would come at the end of the service. They'd sing, just as I am without, whatever, you know, the Billy Graham song, you know. And they'd sing 4,000 verses of that. And I would stand there and, and I'd have my hands on the back of the pew in front of me because I knew that I had sin in my life. I knew I needed to confess. I knew I needed to get better. I knew I needed to stop doing that, but I'd just white knuckle it. I'd hold them to the back of the pew and I'd just finally make it through the end of the service and I'd get out and I'd be like, whew, thank God, you know. Now I'm not sure what's going on. Is that my mic there or, okay. Let's all just sit and meditate and listen to this for a moment, all right? If we need to fix this and get me another mic, let's do that because uh, I don't know about y'all, but this is my problem and I need to get it fixed right now. So uh, there we go, thanks. All right, good, good. Well, the fact is, I grew up in a church like that and I grew up in a, a the kind of environment like that that was really based. It was based on what I did. It was based on how good I was. It was based on how hard I tried. And what I discovered was that kind of Christianity was extremely, extremely discouraging. I, I couldn't keep up. I mean, the harder I tried, the worse it got. The more I white knuckled it, the more aware I became of my sin. And the more aware I became of my sin, then the more I sinned. It was weird how it worked. And when I discovered what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the passage we're going to read today, when I discovered that the key to living the Christian life is not my singular effort, 
but depending on the spirit of the living God in me and trusting in him, when I began to discover that, it began to revolutionize my Christian life. It began to give me peace and joy. And suddenly I found joy in serving the Lord. Suddenly I loved it. Suddenly my relationship with God was so much better. And you know what? I discovered that I wasn't thinking about my sin as much. And the less I thought about it, the less I did it, and the less it controlled me, and the more I was controlled by the Spirit of God, and the more He delivered me, and the freer I became, and the better Christian I became. You see, for many of us, we've got a problem. And the problem is us. And we don't realize that the problem lies within our effort, within our approach to serving the living God. God wants us to learn how to depend on him. Well, let me just set this up before I read it. There was a group of people in this church that Paul wrote to, and uh, we would call them Judaizers. Now, they didn't call them that back then, but as we studied it, we call them Judaizers. And here's what a Judaizer was. A Judaizer, we would call this person uh, today a, a legalist, a person that's guilty of legalism. And what they did was they added works to salvation. That's technically what uh, legalism is. And so what they would do is they would, uh, these are Jewish people, and they would tell others in the church, they would say, in order for you to be a Christian, you got to keep the Jewish law and trust Jesus. So in other words, they were adding to what the Bible tells us about salvation. And God says, don't add to You don't get to add to. It's not works-based. It's grace-based. It's all of grace. It's all of Jesus. It's all of his work on the cross. Amen. Thank God. Praise God for that. Amen. But the fact is, folks, look, these Judaizers, what they did was they told people, hey, you got to keep these laws. It's really no different than people today. Do you realize that the American church is filled with people? They don't call themselves Judaizers, but that's exactly what they are. They say, in order for you to be a Christian, you got to be a good person. You got to turn over a new leaf. Got to keep the rules. Did you know that the average American believes that in order to be right with God, in order to go to heaven when you die, you got to keep the Ten Commandments. That would be kind of like what Judaizers did. They said, you know what you got to do? You got to keep the law got to be a good person. You got to turn over a new leaf. And that is the silliest approach to Christianity that you can possibly think of. That would be like saying, hey, you know what? I've got cancer, but as soon as I get better, I'm going to go to the doctor. And there are a lot of Christians that approach the Christian life that way, just like the Judaizers did, just like this group of people that think you've got to uh, keep the Ten Commandments or that you've got to... Now, Now, once again, We're not suggesting go break the Ten Commandments. Don't leave here and say, well, Pastor Richie said don't keep the Ten Commandments. Let's go steal something. No, that's not what I'm saying. Pastor Richie said you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Uh, You can go out and murder somebody if you get mad at them. No, that's not what I'm saying. The fact of the matter is that is not the approach to a relationship with God. That's all the Bible is showing us, okay? And so that was the first group. They were guilty of legalism. But the second group in this church, you see, they had a problem. One group was like, hey, you got to add to the gospel. The second group, they were what we would call, they were guilty of libertinism. Or uh, if you will, just being, having license. And what that group did was, they said, it doesn't matter how you live. We believe in the grace of God and therefore, It doesn't matter how you live. You can sin as much as you'd like. Uh, You can do as much wrong as you would like and nobody's gonna bother you. It's all good. God, wink, wink, looks at it uh, and, and turns a blind eye to our sin. Well, we know that's not true either. The Apostle Paul wrote about that in the book of Romans. He said, that's, that's crazy. And as a result of that, there became, there, there uh, started a group of people that would be what we would call today universalists. And he said, what's a universalist? Well, a universalist is one that says, in the end, everybody goes to heaven when they die. Doesn't really matter what they do. They're all the same. All religions are the same. We're all going to head the same place. And at the end of our life, it doesn't matter how you live, whether you're an atheist or not, whether you're a Buddhist or a Catholic or a Baptist or a believer, or a, it doesn't matter because in the end, God loves everybody 
wink, wink, and uh, everybody's going to go to heaven when they die. Do you realize that if that were true, that God would be most cruel and wicked and evil? He would not be God. He would not be capable of being God because the very definition of God is absolute holiness and perfection. And if God sent his son to die in our place, to die on a cross, to die for the sins of the world, to take the punishment of the world, and yet there was no need for that, God would be most cruel indeed, would he not? So that's not possible for there to be universalism. I mean, there is people that believe, there are people that believe that, but that is not possible for that to be a way to be made right with God. So we had these people, we had the legalists that were adding to salvation, uh, saying you had to keep your, you had to keep uh, good works. Then you had the people that were guilty of the license. They were like, it doesn't matter how you live. It's a big party. Let's all go live however we like. And then there were the universalists that said, hey, it doesn't matter. In the end, everybody's going to go to heaven. Did you know that people are filled, that churches rather are filled with people like that today? And, and we'll take it a step further because there was also another group there uh, that um, they, they, they denied that life change was necessary in their life. They thought because of their parents' religion that they were okay. And the church is filled with people like that today. There are churches filled with people that just because their grandma bought a pew down at the Methodist church and got a little black brass uh, plaque on the end of the pew that they're going to heaven when they die. Or just because their grandma was a good person. Or just because they went to Sunday school as a child. Or just maybe because they were baptized as a child. Look, the fact is, God shows us in the Word of God that our relationship with God is not about rules keeping. Jesus Christ died on the cross and he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died so that we could be made right with God. That's what Jesus did for us. That's why the Bible tells us that we depend on him. Jesus lived that perfect life that we could not live. He kept all the rules that we could not keep. And so that led to, I believe, another group of people, which is most common among many good Christians in churches today. And that's a second form of legalism. You see, the first form is people that aren't saved, they add works to salvation. But the second is those that think that the only way to please God is by trying to earn God's favor. And the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot make God love you one bit more than he loves you right now. He loves you most completely, more than you can possibly know. He knows you better than anybody else knows you in the history of your life. And yet he loves you more than anybody has ever loved you. God loves you. And, and legalism, as we would define it, um, is in the church... I, as a Christian, like I lived as a teenage boy, as I was telling you about, I was just so sin conscious and I was so aware of the things going on around me that I thought the only possible way for me to be a good Christian was to keep this long list of rules. And man, we, the, the, the church that I grew up in, we, we had so many rules about stuff like that. Do you know that we had rules like men, boys could not have hair that was long over your ears? For some reason, I don't know what that has to do with Christianity, but that uh, sure was uh, one of the rules that we had. You could not go to the skating rink. Now, I'm not sure what's ungodly about the skating rink. Uh, I don't like going to the skating rink because I don't like falling down, all right? But the fact is, there's nothing sinful about going to the skating rink. You couldn't go to the bowling alley. I'm not sure why we could not go to the bowling alley. I'm not sure how that became a sin. Uh, but because I grew up in tobacco country in North Carolina, when you're 12 years old, you can smoke cigarettes on the front porch of the, uh, of the church, but bless God, you could not go to the bowling alley afterwards. All right, so do you see how silly that becomes? And there are churches filled with people that that is exactly what they think Christianity is. The way I dress. Now, you, you shouldn't walk around naked. I mean, you should, you should dress appropriately, but your clothing doesn't really have a lot to do with your Christianity. Your hairstyle doesn't have a lot to do with your Christianity. The fact is, you and I must learn that legalism can take its form in our life by our substituting our relationship with God with a list of rules. 
And what that leads to is misery. And it leads to failure. And what will happen is you won't quit sinning, you'll sin more. You won't quit feeling bad, you'll feel worse. You won't feel closer to God, you'll feel further and further away from him every day of your life. Well, don't live in defeat. Don't live under the power of sin when God says you can live in the freedom of Christ. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that approach to Christianity sound familiar? Do those problems sound familiar to you? Well, in what we're going to read today, this passage, Paul contrasts the life in the spirit and life in the flesh. That's what he calls it, life in the spirit and life in the flesh. So we're going to begin reading in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. He says, but I say, walk by the spirit. Notice that little phrase, walk by the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, you're going to overcome your sin not by trying harder, but by trusting more. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Do you see what he says? The, see the contrast there? He says, when you try to do it by your own power, you're going to fail. You're going to live by uh, the, the power of the flesh. And you're not going to do the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, you're not being driven down by being the, the, uh, the legalist. You're not being that person that thinks that the approach to Christianity is your good nature, your good works, your, uh, all of your good things that you do, keeping the Ten Commandments. That is not how to be made right with God. That is not how to be closer to God. He said, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, being led by the Spirit is not a feeling, but an action. A lot of people, when they hear about being led by the Spirit, they just think that's a compulsion. Oh, I was led by the Spirit to do that. I've heard people tell me they felt led by the Spirit to leave their wife. And I'm not kidding about that. They were serious as they could be. And they knew that that was not right. They knew the Spirit of God was not leading them to do that. And what were they operating by? They were operating by the desire of the flesh, okay? Not by the desire of the Spirit, not by the leading of the Spirit of God in their life. And so uh, we must be aware of that. He said, uh, now, don't be this rules-based Christian because it's not a feeling, but rather it's an action. It's an action, trusting in God. And then he, gives, then he goes into listing off all these sins. Now, I'm going to read them. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because he goes to show that this is what the power of my flesh produces. Okay? And let's look at the list. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, in other words, sexual sins. Did you realize that even as a believer, you can be guilty of this and live in this when you operate by the power of the flesh? That's what he's saying. He goes on to say uh, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, that's hatred or having an unforgiving spirit. Man, I've seen many Christians have an unforgiving spirit. Strife. You ever have strife in your home? You have strife at your job? You, have, you ever have strife with your family? He said, that's a work of the flesh. That is a result of depending on your own power. Um, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, in other words, selfish ambition, dissension. Um, he goes on to say divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. That's literally, that, that, word literally is translated late night parties like going to strip clubs. That's actually what the word means. So he says, and things like these, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let's hit a little pause button here. He's not suggesting that if you've ever done any of these sins, that you're not going to be able to go to heaven. He's saying that life in the spirit rather than life in the flesh transforms you and that real believers, true believers allow God to transform their life. But we know this to be true because 
there are many of the people in the Bible that we read about that were guilty of some of these sins. When they depended on their own flesh, when they depended on their own strength, when they depended on their own power, they were guilty of these things. People like King David, people like Moses, people like Solomon. And so what he's saying is this, when you begin to understand that the power of the flesh, life in the flesh will not change you, will not help you, it will do nothing but harm you and burden you. And only through the power of the Spirit does real lasting life change happen. So that's what he's saying. Now, then he gives a contrast. The power of the flesh. When I walk in my flesh, I get angry. I get jealous. I'm envious. Uh, all these things happen. But when I walk by the Spirit, notice what, he ha- notice what happens. But the fruit of the Spirit... The fruit of the Spirit. Now understand, the works of the flesh, that's what I do. A work is something I produce. A fruit is something only God can produce. How many know that? I can plant a seed. I can't grow a pear tree. Only God can grow a pear tree. I can plant it. I can water it. I can fertilize it, but I can't grow it. That's God's job. The fruit of the Spirit is what God does in my life. The fruit of the flesh is, or the work of the flesh is what I'm able to produce in my life. And all he's saying is this, if you're depending on what your flesh produces, it's gonna be a pretty sad day in your Christian life because it's not gonna work. But if you'll depend on the spirit of God, he will do what only he can do and he will produce fruit in your life. He says this, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Did you know you have no right to say that you are incapable of loving others when the Spirit of God lives in you? You have no right to say that. Now, it's hard sometimes, but you can love others that are unlovely when you have the Spirit of God in you. He produces joy. Did you know in the middle of COVID-19, did you know in the middle of this past almost year that's gone by that we do not have the right to say we have no joy? It can be frustrating, but joy comes from our relationship with God. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience. Is there anybody here besides me that has a little problem with patience sometimes? Sometimes I pray, Lord, I want patience, but I want it right now, all right? I see some of you raising your hand. I I see those hands. You know what I mean when I say that, right? Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wow, I don't have any right to say that I can't control my temper or my appetite or my feelings. He says, I, through the Spirit of God, can have self-control in my life. He says, against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So in other words, I allow my flesh, my fleshly desires, my own self-efforts to be crucified with Christ. And by trusting the Spirit of God, God transforms me and makes me a better Christian, gives me victory over my sin gives me the power to live for him. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, I hope you saw the contrast here of the problem. I've got a problem. You've got a problem. And the problem is us. And only when we begin to depend on the Spirit of God and walk by the Spirit of God and live by the Spirit of God, are we able to overcome that problem and live the kind of life that God wants us to live? So what's the key? It's really just a one-point message today. It is to walk by the Spirit. That's what he says. Walk by the Spirit. Now, he, he uses three different terms to describe this. He said we're to walk by the Spirit. We're to be led by the Spirit. Now, let me explain that. Is feeling involved in being led by the Spirit? Yes, but it's not just a feeling. You know, I can feel uh, led by the Spirit to do something that maybe not God's will for my life, and I can blame it on my feelings. So that's not what he's saying. He's saying walk by the Spirit. 
Depend on the Spirit of God. Um, be led by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. All three of these ideas give the, the thought of clinging to, of staying close to, and following to a next destination. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. When I begin to understand that it's not my flesh, not my goodness, not my strength, but God, the Spirit of God. You know what I'm doing? I'm, cl I'm clinging to Him. And every day, you start your day by clinging to God. Lord, I don't have the ability to do this. God, I can't overcome this sin by myself. God, I, I can't solve this problem by myself, but I'm gonna cling to you. And when you do that, you're walking by the Spirit and you're trusting Him. And then you're keeping in step with the Spirit. You're following Him. You're being led by God to a destination. We talk a lot about our next steps here at Avalon Church. We say that we're just keep on taking your next step. Keep on taking your next step with the Holy Spirit of God. And God promises to be with you. Now this entire picture of being led by the Spirit is this idea, it's a picture. I want you to get a mental picture of a child clinging to his father. If you've ever had children, you know what that's like. When my children were little, uh, they would love to grab a hold of my leg. And uh, that was always fun for me. They, they just wanted to cling onto my leg and, and let me kind of walk them around the room, you know. And that's the idea. God says, I want you to cling to me. I want you to trust me. I want you not to trust your own self, not to trust your own effort, not to live by this list of rules and regulations that drive the life out of you, but rather, I want you to cling to me and trust me and live by my spirit. Now, when you do that, you're able to stay close. You're able to trust. You're able to step in the Father's steps. And then there are times that the most effective Christian living you can do is let the Father carry you. And when I begin to live that way, it is transformative in my life. And suddenly I go from the guilt feelings to the grace feelings. And suddenly I stop living by legalism and I start living by the grace of God. And that's what God wants for your life. And that's what I want for this church. And that's what I want for you. And my prayer for you is this, that you will learn to live by walking by the Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all to live by the Spirit. Help us to realize it's not our effort. It's not our goodness. It's not our strength, but it's yours. And I pray that you bless us. With our heads bowed, those of you watching online that have joined us as you do every week, I want to give you the opportunity today for two things. One, to trust Christ as your Savior. And maybe you would pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and I'm asking you to save me right now. And I, and I hope you'll uh, put there on the screen, the, uh, the screen function there where you can click that you pray to receive Christ today. Fill out a next step card and uh, let us know what your next step is. Then I encourage you to pray that prayer that God help me to walk by your spirit. And that's my prayer for you today. Then for those of you that are in the room today, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer as well. Heavenly Father, help me walk by the Spirit. Help me to walk by the Spirit. And when you begin to do that, it will transform your life. And that's my prayer for you. I wonder how many would say in the room today by raising your hand, Pastor Richie, that's my prayer today. I want to live by the Spirit. I want to walk by the Spirit and trust in Him rather than my own strength and my own flesh. Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand lots of you. I've got my hand raised as well. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to walk by the Spirit of God, help us to walk in your strength and your power. In Jesus' name. And then for those of you in the room today, if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior, the same little prayer that we prayed a while ago with those online, you ask Jesus to come into your life. Take the next step card, put your name on it that you receive Christ, and, uh, and we'll follow up with you uh, with that today. Father, I pray that you'd save people today. Help us to have transformation in this church and in this city and in this region. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.